Hey guys, welcome back to the Development Tank. Pump today. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be announcing some amazing partnerships on a few different levels, on a few different things. So make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn the bell notifications on so you don't miss a thing. But this is going to be stuff that you're going to want to know. And Jonesy's back. It's going to be a ripper today. We're talking about development, do's and don'ts. So how to get development ready and make sure that you don't take a wrong turn. Let's get into it. All right, let's get into it, guys. Jonesy's back and he's got something to get off his chest. Thanks, Pete. Um, well, it's been a bit of a common theme, not a theme that we want to necessarily be addressing over the last couple of weeks, but you know, the theme for today is around getting development ready. So basically avoiding getting yourself into a tricky situation, um, making sure that you're making the right decisions up front and you've got a profitable development, whether that's your coming to us or you're out there taking it on yourself, engaged in our network, however you are tackling it, just trying to avoid some of the issues that we've sort of confronted with or I'm confronted with in particular. You know, people coming to us with a site that's they haven't done the right things at the front end and they're trying to find the silver bullet or the magic wand that just isn't there to to turn their, I guess, their fortunes around. So really this is about setting yourself up for success and preparation is key in property development. Preparation is key in anything, Nathan, as you know. Uh, but yeah, I think a really great topic to talk to everyone about because like we say, especially in your segments, that if a couple of people or a handful of people are thinking about this and coming to you, there's there's a lot behind them that you're not talking to. But I think, yeah, getting development ready, asking those questions from the outset, having your exit strategies in place, all these sorts of things can be sussed out before you spend a dollar where some of these people, which you're about to tell us about, they've spent a lot of money to get to a point where it doesn't look that good for them. So, yeah, yeah, and, no, they're about to, and they're about to lose some more. So, Mate, tell us about the couple that you've been speaking to and, and, and let's see if we can unpack how that could have been done better. Yeah, look, it's the first one's, um, you know, a guy down the Mornington Peninsula has a site, has gone all the way through, you know, obviously acquired it, um, hasn't really thought about how to fund the build, um, has gone through, spent all soft cost design, landscaping, achieved a planning permit, ready to sort of dive into the next step hasn't really considered the funding side of things yeah. um and wants us to unpack it from a feasibility you know they've done it higher level um they're confident that it's going to work and then i guess the deeper i dived in on that i was thinking i'm not sure there's much here right um when you look at where they were sitting i think the biggest question mark for mine was comparable sales data oh, they've done a great job as a beautiful looking project etc but it wasn't apples for apples from what I could see in terms of where they were comparing it to do. You know, their comparable sales are much closer to the beach, much, you know, better spec product, much bigger product. Um, and obviously then, you know, the further you unpack that, they're looking for a bit of a silver bullet in terms of can we you know, produce a better outcome, which ultimately a lot of people, you're finding them get to that point and they, they can't and there's a reason why. Yeah, for sure. And I think... Yeah, some people, and you know, recent years haven't been good to feasibilities, um, but super important that you keep your finger on the pulse. I feel like, and and like you said, if you're not getting your comparables right, like we speak to, you know, we speak to Gav about this all the time. Can't get your comparables right, and if your build price is a bit wrong, you know, we can be a long way a off. A long way off, yeah. Long way off, and and sometimes people, you feel like you speak to them, and they're nearly trying to trick themselves into thinking that that they were right. And this site does stack up. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. When potentially their builds estimates unders and their and their resales are really high. So so it's so it's potentially, you know, really, really broken. So um and and like we talk about here all the time, the feasibility calculator in the calculator in the network's great, but it's about data in and data out. And the data in is super important to make sure the data out is good. So sure. For sure. That's one example. And we can unpack how, you know, particularly the, the comparable sales data, you know, a little bit later on. I guess the second sort of case study, a lady down sort of southeast Melbourne, um, you know, relatively good site in a good suburb, you know, pretty close to amenity, but there's sort of some negatives to it, um, you know, being close to a train line, a level crossing, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, the same sort of story, you know, gone, you know, held the site, gone through done plans permits use landscape designers architects etc really beautifully specced product yeah um and 
you know, I, I think, you know, as I sort of unpack that again, same sort of issues, you know, they've sort of faced a, a market that's, uh, that's changed quite a lot with some, you know, some headwinds, particularly with, from a construction point of view, but, you know, obviously again, not keeping finger on the pulse, um, have they had the opportunity over that time to maybe pull it back maybe change the strategy look at different ways in terms of making it work but instead progressed all the way through and now are just looking for the one to produce a better result which ultimately you know they've 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 sort of gone so far in mm. and they're sort of finding it really difficult to wind themselves back out yeah correct and and that's what and that's what we see that happens they they jump on this path and they stick to the path and really until probably build stage and then they get their prices back and, and the whole thing sort of blown up, but uh, potentially could have pivoted at a certain point as well, but um, get on a path and just want to sort of see it out, I suppose, and potentially not surrounded by the right people as well that are sort of saying, hey, you know, my finger's on the pulse. These are the prices I'm seeing. Are you guys in a position to do this and um, essentially get themselves into a spot where, yeah, their options aren't looking too good. You know, there's, you know, you could maybe build the site, but it's going to cost a lot of money mm-hmm. and potentially not realize the return they're chasing. Sell the site, take the haircut, um, you know, which can be pretty nasty. Um, because also, and, and, and I know you speak to people like this all the time, some people just think because you get a permit on a site that they're going to make, yeah. they're going to make some money and, and it's not always the case. Yeah, like... You know, I guess maybe in the bigger space where you're really adding value by, you know, obviously putting larger scale developments on it. But in the resi space, like I think there's there's so much information and data out there now that people have their finger on the pulse. So this the old adage of I'm just going to flip it. Like when yeah. it gets to the point, like people are seeing through that now. Like if you do any kind of digging into some of the things we'll talk about today, you'll quickly work out there's a reason why that site's on the market. So that whole I'm just going to flip it uh, mentality doesn't necessarily stack up. There's a reason why people have chosen to do that, and that's because it's not stacking up for them. Yeah, correct. I think when people see a site, and like you said, they're 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 geared up. The information's there. If they see a site on the market, is is a good chance that. You know, the money's not in it, and that's why the developer's looking to flip it. Um, not too often a developer's looking to flip something with chock block full of margin. So, And not to mention these smaller type resi sites, you pay one layer of stamp duty, and then obviously you want to transact it again, which puts another layer of stamp duty into it, which um, really sort of um, eats can away. slow these things down. Yeah, yeah eats away at it. Um, so I guess the, the, I guess the whole point of what we wanted to discuss today was how do you avoid falling into that trap? Yeah, um, correct. I think how can you get yourself set up at the start so a lot of this can be unpacked and the contingency can be stacked inside the plan, you know, the you know your strategy. So when these things do arise, you know, you've got a bit of a plan here, you know, and ultimately try and navigate in a way that these issues don't arise. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's part of it, right? I think as you probably watch a lot of the content that we put out, like there is there is a lot to it. There's a mm. lot of planning, a lot of strategy. Um, you know, it's understanding a whole heap of different variables before, you know, pushing the button on something. Um, and that's what we're trying to kind of unpack before we even get to the point of, you know, we've purchased the site, like, if you've got an interest in development and that's the way you want to go, you want to be a property developer, well, these are the things you've got to consider before you even get there. Yep. Um, and this kind of flows into a previous ep- my previous episode about funding and joint ventures, but really it's around getting the team behind you. But prior to even getting the team behind you, it's, it's number one is understanding your motivations and the strategy. You know, is this going to be your principal place of residence? Do you plan, if you're doing a dual lock, are you going to live in one of them and keep it as your primary residence? You know, is it a build and hold strategy? Are you trying to increase the rental yields? Or is it a build to sell strategy where you're building them, you're developing, you're increasing the capital, um, you know, the capital growth in the site and you're wanting to cash out and move on to the next one. I think unpacking some of that and the reasons why you would be, wanting to participate in this and 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 take you know the development risks if you like um and understanding that is the first and most important point yeah i think yeah we talk about here the motivations a lot like when we unpack a client you've spoken to or something like what are the motivations you know and i think once you can dive into those and 
you know, like we, we develop for a lot of people and we manage for a lot of people and, you know, we might manage for family members that each one, each person's going to live in one each and um, we develop for strictly investors. We, de- we develop for people that are building their portfolios and looking to hold and, you know, uh, you know, turn these things into a negative, uh, sorry, turn these things into a positively geared asset, do depreciation schedules, really get them, get the cash flow going on them. So there's lots of different motivations and I feel like understanding that can help you then direct the people properly into their into their development journey. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's basically the number one question that I ask. Yeah. Um, and the reason why that changes is, you know, if it is a PPR play, you can probably afford to spend more money and not really looking at the margin because you're going to live there. There's going to be, capital growth over the period of time that you live there this isn't an in and out type play Um, whereas you know if you're doing it from a leasing strategy you're probably going to pair that back and try and make that as as cost effective as possible and increase the yield as much as possible and then the build to sell is like well that's more driven by time frame and cost Mm. you're obviously wanting to control that as much as you can to maximize your return i guess then the second team which kind of dovetails into what i spoke about last week was getting the right team around you you know broker accountant legal yep. a, a development manager or project manager um, which is the skill set we probably bring and then depending on how close you are to it like having a builder to keep your finger on the pulse mm. and be engaged from those early stages to understand where costs sit is important particularly if you're not like if you've started the planning permit 12 months earlier on a budget of what you're planning to spend you go through that process and haven't recosted along the journey, there's going to be changes. Um, and you'd want to make sure that you're continually reflecting on that and checking it and keeping you know, across what that cost would potentially or could potentially be. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Jonesy. Like, and, and, and that's the thing. We're fortunate in here. We're, we're pricing jobs all the time. We're running build tenders all the time, getting, getting, getting pricing back. So our finger's right on the pole. So it allows us to pivot when required, when and if required. But for people doing this and they're only doing one project, to have a builder sort of riding shotgun, just to, just to, you know, you, they make a change on the drawings, they can they can call the builder and say, hey, we've done this, we've done that. And um, it just leaves them in a position to, to make educated decisions throughout the process rather than, like you say, setting it up from the get-go, getting 12 months in and going, I got there, but all these things, all these macro things have happened inside the marketplace that they haven't really been aware of. Um, so to have a builder riding shotgun with you, I think I think's a great one. Yeah, if you can afford to do that for sure, um, no doubt about it. Because I think that's where a lot of the expense comes in, particularly in this space, right? Like you, mm. um, over, you know, from an engineering perspective and a you know, buildability point of view, you can you can have this idea in your mind, and the designer goes away and does it, says yes, it's on budget. And you take yeah. it to the builder, and he goes, "Oh, this is going to cost you a fortune." Like you haven't considered steel, you haven't considered scaffolding, and yeah. all of a sudden, um, these sort of hidden costs blow the budget right out. Yeah, correct. No, no, I think the builder is an important one, especially if you're going it alone. Number three is budget feasibility of sites. Um, and just understanding those locations in detail. Um, you know, I guess, you know, the way in which we operate, we're sort of looking at that 15 plus percent return on cost to sort of give a project a tick, but it's being able to reverse engineer that. Um, and by doing that, you're understanding your, the market, you're understanding the data, you're understanding the value of the land, what the type of product is going to look like, sizes, specifications, um, and being able to reverse engineer that to get a result, um, you know, particularly with that comparable sales data that we touched on before, like it's got to be relative, it's got to be accurate, and it's also got to be achieved. Mm. Like there can be products or um, there could be properties on the market right now that people are really trying to chase something that's beyond what the what the, the site or the suburb has seen. So I think having, having achieved realized um, sales is important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And we talk about that a bit with Gav and and it's about you rarely get your genuine apple and apple. You know, you don't get your Ford Falcon versus your Ford Falcon. You just you just don't. You you know, product will either be in a slightly better location, slightly better orientation, slightly better product, all these things, or slightly worse in all those areas. Mm-hmm. So super important to appreciate exactly what your product's gonna be so you can fairly compare them against 
um, these other benchmarks and come up sort of with your price. And obviously in here, we like to do realistic, dial it back to pessimistic, dial it up to optimistic to give ourselves some range, just so we can get an understanding that, hey, if, we've, if we're a bit pessimistic here, um, where are we going to sit? And if, hey, if things get a bit more optimistic, where are they going to go? Just, just to give us a bigger, a bigger set of goals, I suppose. But yeah, that, that whole comparable sale point of view can get it wrong and it can have you buying a site that you shouldn't have. Um, get it wrong the other way, can have you passing on a site that probably you shouldn't have. So um, very important skill set. For sure. And I think within that, um, is understanding the location. So mm -hmm. a couple of those examples or case studies I gave earlier was like your comparative sales where you can, from, from one suburb to the next and even inside that suburb from one street to the next, one pocket to the next, it can change quite considerably once you cross over a street, a highway closer to amenity and beaches, parks, like all of that changes so i think being able to weigh up the difference of where the site you're considering and the site you're looking at comparative to all of these other comparable sales in the area and what are they what are their pros and cons compared to yours yeah correct i think that's that's a good one so you you know got a long list you break down from location point of view from a spec point of view from a floor plan facade point of view from an age of property point of view so has the town is the townhouse 10 years old that's achieved that result you're going to be delivering brand new so all these things go into the mixing pot of trying to get your sales right um, what advice would you give people out there that you know, don't do this every day like us. How, how are they going to do this? And maybe who would they use? Who could they call and use inside, um, you know, their reach to be able to get these answered? Well, like there's a lot accessible online. Um, you know, Domain, REA, you, they've got, um, you know, sales functions where you can look at sales within that area and dialing that in and then it's really just doing your own research on that like yeah. ex all of the sort of key variables that we're talking about unpacking that like it's all there and if it's not and it says contact agent then the next step would be contact agents yeah, and build point. relationships if you're interested in development and this is an area that you want to pursue pursue whether it's part-time or you know eventually full-time relationships and network are key like you go and speak to gav mm. he'd have them all on speed dial and i'm constantly in contact with them just trying to keep a finger on the pulse in terms of where that market sits what yeah. resales are like what you know how much is this land work what's this pocket like what should what do you recommend putting on here what do the people want out there yeah um so i think those two in particular that's where i'd start yeah yeah great yeah great advice and and like you say connect with the agents if you're looking to be active in the property market that's who the agents want to be friendly with so they will help you if you you know if you reach out and ask and even when you get these comparables you know to go even deeper which one are we doing here speak to the agent you know were there any underbidders or was that one buyer that fitted that one house and and that was a big result with no one really underneath it or behind it so i think all that sort of context is sort of super important to to you know i guess really pinpoint what kind of sale that was for sure I think the fifth and probably most important point in all of that is the exit strategy. I reckon, um, I think that's part of the problem when people do come to me looking if, to see if we can possibly help and they've progressed, they've progressed so far down the line. I don't think that has been considered. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're looking at you being fully out in terms of covering the total cost of the project, you know, whether that's, you know, you've been, you're using, um, you know, bank finance or private finance, however that may be, can you actually hold that? So if it's a $3 million project at completion, can I hold both dwellings if it's a dual occupancy site? Or do I need to plan on selling one down? Do I need to sell both down? You know, is this a joint venture? Or am I going to live in one? And is is my other partner going to live in the other? How are we going to manage if there was a change in the economic climate, if the prices do go down? The consideration of how you're going, you know, we're, we're talking about how you enter. Before you even enter, you need to consider how you're going to exit. Yeah, I think that's a that's a ripper, Jonesy. And, and ultimately, you know, that plan can alter throughout the process, but understand all 
the stops along the way and and you know put in the contingencies and understand where you're going because if if that if you do get sideswiped by you know some economic headwinds and things like that how are you going to exit at that point don't think about it when you're already in there think about it and have those plans in place so yeah exit strategy um super important for sure and then the final one i think it's just if you're on the cusp of actively getting involved in property development and if this discussion in particular seems pretty complex you're like oh this is so much i need to consider like it's just becomes overwhelming like don't be afraid to reach out and speak to a professional whatever whoever that may be it might be a builder it could be a real estate agent from a land purchase perspective you know it could be someone like us to talk about your possibilities in a development sort of landscape and how you would potentially enter the market but talk to people who are in the know and are living and breathing it every single day to build your own knowledge yeah 100 percent. i think that's a ripper and anyone playing along at home little fish network to become a fish is free uh jump in they'll be pinned to the comments and takes two seconds thank me later but you'll be in there it's free and all these little nuggets and these bits of information it's all it's all in there and then jump in and ask a question and there's professionals in there the community in there lots of different spaces but get in there and start grabbing this information and, and don't be afraid to ask. You'd rather ask now and get the info and get the intel before you launch into a costly exercise than launch and think you're going to learn along the way. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the whole point, right? The preparation. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it once the site's acquired. You know, you would listen to what Gav and Claire unpack on a regular basis. But even this is prior to even getting there. Because um, the thing is, like, you, you may want to be involved in property development but you can't underestimate the level of work and detail that needs to go into actually make it successful and you know i think that the amount of people that are coming to us and and we're and that i'm talking to that you're talking to that haven't considered all of this stuff at the front end and mm. these possibilities um you know even if they don't come to fruition it's just addressing in your mind how am i going to navigate them if they do come up and do the pre-planning you know there is no silver bullet. There's no magic wand once you're, once you're in that deep. Mm. Like you've got there for a reason and it may have been just the one or two poor decisions along the way or you know, haven't prepared correctly or got the right data and information in that early stages and it can become a very costly exercise. Yeah, 100%, Jonesy. Ripper episode, mate, well done. Um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with some more gold, no doubt. But yeah, lots of, lots of value in that, mate. Well done. Cheers. Thanks, mate. All right, guys, anyone that's going to get value out of that, please share that with someone who's looking to get involved. If you know anyone in your circles, in your networks, that's on the cusp of getting involved, that is a ripper episode. And again, become a fish for free, littlefishnetwork.com.au. Bang, get involved. Happy developing.